spaceships in the night, letting cannonballs fly. See what you mean, and it turns to a fight. Fists fly from my mouth as it turns south. You're down the driveway, I'm on the couch, chasing your dreams since the violent fifth grade. Trying to believe in your side. In this episode, we're going to cover the first of our four biomolecules. And this one's going to be on carbohydrates. But what are biomolecules? Well, as the name implies, it has bio in it. Well, that just means it deals with life. So this is something that's essential for life. The word molecules means that it has covalent bonds attached to it. Covalent, there we go. Okay, great way to remember this is molecule. Molecule is the cute girl that sits next to you in your chemistry class, and she's so cute you want to share something with her because this prefix co means share. And you want to share, whoops, let's fix this line here. You want to share your electrons with her. Right. So a biomolecule is a molecule that's used as an essential process with living things. And there's four of them. And if you kind of think of your food groups, you're going to recognize three of these. These four are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acid. Carbohydrates are usually uh, types of sugars. Lipids are mainly fats and oils, but there's some other types, and we're going to say that for another screencast. Uh, proteins and nucleic acids, these guys are kind of cousins, and they are really, really important. And we're going to have another series of screencasts that covers these. So we're going to have a series on proteins, and then we're going to have a real short series on nucleic acids. But we're going to get to nucleic acids in much more detail when we get to Chapter 12, which is coming up in another screencast. All right, so let's brush this away, and let's learn about carbohydrates. Well, what the heck is a carbohydrate? Well, like a lot of things in science, the word is telling you what it means. So if you look in here, Carbo, that refers to carbon. So one of the most important things you're going to find in this is carbon. And in fact, all the biomolecules, those four, those four, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, they're all going to have a carbon backbone. Like we covered in, a, in one of the first uh, uh, screencasts in this uh, series on, on um, you know, how carbon can form four covalent bonds at once, it can form chains, and it can form rings. The hydrate part, well, that simply refers to water. So basically, you see here in red, a carbohydrate is made up of only three things, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the ratio is really important. It's a one to two to one ratio. One uh, carbon atom, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And this two to one essentially comes from water because you have two hydrogens, for every one oxygen. So here's a perfect example of glucose, and I want to give you a little insight here. Anything that ends with an OSE, that's a sugar. So think of fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, those are all sugars. One to two to one ratio. This always occurs in a carbohydrate. So this stuff in red you must memorize that. That just smells like a quiz question. Now, we just been on the previous podcast or, or screencast. We were talking about monomers and polymers, and then the two chemical reactions that are involved with those two guys, dehydration synthesis and, and hydrolysis. Dehydration synthesis is when you take two monomers and you put them together. It takes energy to make that new bond, and when you make that new bond, a water molecule is going to fall out. Hydrolysis is the exact opposite. You take this new molecule that you made, you break it, and when you break it, you're going to release energy and you're going to put the water back in that you took away the first time. All right, so what is the monomer? And remember, monomer means one part. So it's the subunit of a carbohydrate. It's called a monosaccharide. Mono, once again, refers to one, but saccharide... It's just a fancy word that means sugar. So one of the things that we call these guys are a single sugar, or usually it's referred to as a simple sugar. Glucose is a type of, of monomer. And as I said before, anything with an OSE 
is a sugar. And so in this case, uh, I know for sure glucose is a monomer and fructose is a monomer. All right. Um, sucrose is a disaccharide. We're going to talk about this later. And I don't remember what lactose is off the top of my head. So uh, if you're more curious, you can simply look that up. Just simply Google it. All right, let's brush this aside and let's move on to the next one. Okay, a disaccharide. This prefix di simply means two. So this would be two saccharides hooked together. And remember, saccharide just means sugar. So we have two monosaccharides connected together. And this is done through that process called polymerization. Remember the other name for polymerization is dehydration synthesis. Long words, let me get caught up. And dehydration synthesis is a word that's just telling you what's going on, taking away the water to make something. Now you will recall from the previous screencast that this is an anabolic process. Anabolic is, bolic means chemical, ana means to build. So just remember this little mnemonic device, ana builds. And when ana builds something, that requires energy. So we'll just simply say uses energy. Sucrose is an example of a disaccharide. And this would be your typical, um, this is your table sugar. All right, so let's brush that away. And here's a graphic that's going to show you how we make maltose, which is a type of uh, sugar. This is actually what we often refer to as malt sugar. If you've ever had a Whoppers malted milk ball, this is the sweet stuff inside of it that gives it that nice you know, sugary taste as a candy. Okay, so dehydration synthesis, taking away water to make something. Maltose is made out of one glucose, and another glucose bonded together. This is what we call the ring form of glucose. Uh, glucose comes in a different form. It can be a chain or it can be a ring. This ring form is by far the most common. Here we've got one functional group. Remember, this is called a hydroxyl. This is a polar. Whoa, there we go. All right, that may be misspelled, but I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, this makes um, sugar polar. And this is why sugars can, devolve, or can dissolve in water really easy. And we're going to remove this hydrogen from another um, hydroxyl group on another one. So remember, we're taking away water. There's the water that we take away. That will be a waste product. That's going to free up a bond right here. That's also going to free up a bond right there. And what we see here is our brand new bond. And this represents stored energy. Because remember, Anna is building something. She's taking away water to build something, and that takes energy, and you're going to store it right in here. Uh, if you really want to sound really smart, you can tell your, your classmates, oh yeah, when you take out water and you put two glucoses together to make maltose, you form a brand new 1,4 glycosidic linkage bond. Duh, who doesn't know that? Just make you sound a little smarter. All right, here we got sucrose. And remember sucrose, this is your table sugar. Same kind of sugar that you're going to put in to make Kool-Aid, throw it on your Cheerios in the morning, use it to bake cookies, etc. Same idea. We have glucose in its ring form, but we also have another new sugar called fructose. This is fruit sugar. Now, fructose also has the formula of C6H12O6. Wait a minute. That's the same chemical formula as glucose. Well, glucose and fructose are what we call isomers. Remember, mer means part, iso means the same. They're the same part. They have the exact same chemical formula, but the atoms are arranged in a different format. Best way to draw this is you simply draw a hexagon for this. We don't really need to write all this extra stuff. But you do want to write this OH group in here. If you ever want to draw fructose, the simplest way is just simply to make a pentagon. So I'll draw one for you real quick. Look like this. So there's your hexagon. And we'll stick an OH off here. And that's the simple version. And then here's your pentagon. And we'll stick an OH group over there. 
So, and you're just going to remove a, an, an entire hydroxyl group from one molecule and just an H off another. That's going to make your waste product of water. And now you're going to make a brand new, mo new bond. This one uh, is stored energy. And the fancy bond here is called a 1,2 glycosidic linkage. Every one of these corners in these rings represents a carbon. So this would be carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. And over here we go with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Uh, I'm in my classroom filming this, and it has a light sensor. So if nobody moves for a while, it goes off. So that's why I had to raise my hand. All right. Just like we did in a previous podcast on polymerization, that's essentially what you're seeing here again. It's an anabolic process. You're storing energy. You got water as a waste, waste product. No different, except we do give our monomers a special name. These are monosaccharides. Remember, that means simple or single sugar. All right, brush that away. And let's move on. Oops, wrong button. Push that one away. Here we go. All right, polysaccharides. If you remember from a previous screencast, the word poly means many. And in our world, many means three or more. So we have three or more saccharides or sugars joined together. Examples of these are starch, which is an energy storage molecule for most plants, and then cellulose, which is a carbohydrate that's used to make up the cell walls of plants. So wood is made out of cellulose. Of course, we use wood to make paper, so the paper that you're probably writing on right now, that's also made out of cellulose. Starch and cellulose, they have pretty much the same uh, arrangement, except, well, let me rephrase this. Starch and, or starch and cellulose are both made out of a long chain of glucose. How the glucoses are arranged is, how, is the difference between starch and cellulose. We'll keep it simple like that. Here we have the hexagon ring form of glucose. So we have one, two, three, four, five monosaccharides joined together to form our polysaccharide. Okay, brush that away, move on. What are the functions of carbohydrates? And they have three. And all you got to do remember is MES. Carbohydrates make a mess. MES. This is the number one function, the main source of energy for all cells. Okay? When your cells in your body need food or energy, they are going to break down a process, or they're going to break down glucose in a process called cellular respiration. And we cover that one, and I believe it's in Chapter 9, but it could be in Chapter 8. Don't quote me on that. And when you do cellular respiration, you're going to use an organelle called the mitochondria. In the mitochondria, in the last step of breaking down glucose to get all the energy out, uses oxygen. So the only reason that you breathe in oxygen is so that you can use it in the final step of getting the maximum amount of energy out of a glucose molecule. It can also be used in for energy storage. Now, animals typically use uh, fat as their storage, but we do store some in the form of a starch-like molecule called glycogen. Glycogen is often referred to as animal starch. We store some in our liver and we also store a little small amount in our muscles, but really by far in our bodies we use fats. Plants almost always use starch exclusively. And you're going to find starch in potatoes, carrots, any type of those root vegetables is going to have a lot, a lot of starch in it. In fact, in a potato, you know, all the white stuff that's used to make a mashed potato, that's like entirely starch. It's a very starchy food. All right. Structure. When we talk about structure, we're talking about maintaining the shape of an organism or, and or I should say, giving it support. And this becomes really, really important in things that don't have bones, like a plant. Plants have cell walls that are made up of cellulose. If you think about a tree, like in our area, the Midwest United States, is that we have hardwoods like oaks, maples, hickory, and these trees can grow to be 100 feet tall. Well, how do you support such a big, massive structure without having bones? You're going to do this through a continuous line of cell wall after cell wall after cell wall. 
And that's essentially what wood is made out of. Wood is the cell walls of the interior of a tree. So that's a very strong, very flexible material that allows the tree to handle the weather over a hundred year or plus um, time frame. Now, when you talk about insects and crabs, they have exoskeletons. And exo means outside. So we, as human beings, we have an endoskeleton. Our skeleton is inside our body. But on a crab or an insect, that hard co coating, like for example, you step on a bug and hear it go crunch, that stuff that went crunch is the exoskeleton. It's on the outside of their body. Um, that is made out of a very close cousin to cellulose called chitin, like you're flying a kite, chitin. Um, it's like when you have peel and eat shrimp or you're going to be eating lobster or crab and you got to crack open the claws or the shell, you're breaking open the chitin so that you can get onto the inside. Okay, So remember, it's M-E-S, main source of energy, energy storage, and structure, which means shape and support. All right. Now, all of these are vocab words, so I'm pretty sure you're going to see these on a test or a quiz at some point during your study of basic chemistry. All right, that's going to wrap it up for, for this episode. Uh, this is also another screencast that I would strongly suggest you watch at least twice as you're preparing for your celebration of knowledge, which in my class is what we call a test. All right, one more episode in this series on Chapter 2B on carbohydrates and lipids, and the next one's going to be on lipids. So we'll catch you the next time.